In the beginning, in Eden, God created a garden. And he planted trees there, trees to partake of for food. And he also placed therein, first, the tree of life, and then the tree of the good and, and evil, no, the knowledge, with the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, the tree of life is Christ, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is Satan. And then in chapter 3 of that great book of Genesis, in the closing verses, because man fell, because of that evil tree, he took that tree of life away from us for that time. And he placed cherubims at the gate with swords so that they would prepare the way and protect the way. You know what a way is? That's a path. That's a way of life. So that man could not at that time partake of that tree of life. It was for that reason that when Christ was yet in the tomb, he went all the way back to that time. As it is written in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. To give those people an opportunity to partake of that tree of life. And to share in it. And then we find out, in as much as it was taken away in the uh, great book of uh, Genesis, that in Revelation chapter 22, we read in verse 1. Revelation chapter 22 in verse 1. We are now come with me. We are now in the eternity. Those that overcome, that overcame are there, and those that didn't are long gone. They're blotted out. In my own personal belief, if you had a friend that was blotted out, you would forget they ever existed. You would shed no tears for them, for they wouldn't be. Okay, even your memories of them, gone. Uh, and this is the life you have. Chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. What, what was that water for? Life. Eternal life. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, that spirit flowed forth freely. In the midst of the street of it, and on either, either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve men of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There could be no boredom. There could be no anger. Because that tree of life does exactly that. That tree being Christ gives you eternal life with happiness, with completeness. When you partake of those leaves, spiritually speaking, now come with me. No flesh in this. Then there can be no boredom. There can be no unhappiness. Those that would create unhappiness are long gone. And unfortunately, we hope they have a good trip. <laughs> okay? Because they, that's why we're in the condition we're in today. It's because of wickedness. And those that cannot discipline themselves. Um, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. That's what they're for. And they will do it gladly and without a whimper. They will consider it indeed a pleasure, just as you consider it a pleasure today to serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. That's that seal again in your forehead. Don't waste your life without having that seal now. It's this word. It's his word of truth. It is the events that he has foretold you of, warned you so that you cannot be surprised. Surprise is what, the unknown is what man fears. So in ignorance is, brings forth the unknown because you haven't studied. And when you're familiar with the simplicity, it isn't complicated, that flows in the word of God, that truth, that seal then you find that happiness, you find that tree. And, um, and in as much as you see his face, you're in the same dimension that he is. You can't see his face today, do you know why? You're not in that dimension, and he's not in yours unless he chooses to be. 
And there shall be no night there, and, there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto them, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which shortly, should shortly, must shortly be done. That's why you need to know it, what's going to shortly come to pass, because we're in that generation where indeed all these prophecies in this generation of the fig tree shall be fulfilled. They're going to come to pass as they are written. So therefore, that's why you want to read. That's why you want to understand. How did the tree of life make it possible that in the great book of Genesis, that tree would be taken away from us? And yet in the great book of Revelation, it is restored. And it is restored for some that believe long before that. And it began when he paid the price. It was, it was an awesome price. As they delivered him up, the flock scattered. Only the women stayed on a small hill off away. The, the disciple he loved, John, he didn't, run, he didn't run. He stood by and Jesus told him, take my mama home. Take Mary home. John did. He was alone. And he cried those words on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. Which is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And fear goes through the hearts of many people in ignorance when they don't realize that even in this he is teaching you. He is placing that seal because he's teaching the 22nd Psalm, which is the only message that we can give on this day of Passover. For it foretold a thousand years. Behold, I have foretold you all things. And he told us on that cross through, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As you know, Jesus never called uh, our Father God. He always called him Father, okay? In whatever language, Ab, Ab, um, and um, uh, calling him Father. And I want you to open your Bibles to that 22nd Psalm before we partake of this blessed event. This is the price that he had to pay. Because you're not perfect. Do you understand that? You're just not perfect to be a sacrifice that could totally overcome. He did it for you. Why? He loves you. He loves you completely and totally. No questions asked. And he stated those words on the cross the words of David, when David was foretelling of the crucifixion, a thousand years, that's a Lord's day, before the fact. Listen to it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring, uh, lamenting, my sad cry? Why, where are, this was David's words. Verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. In other words, day and night, I cry out to you. And whenever you're in pain, you should occasionally talk to him. Let him know what you need. Communicate, communicate, communicate. If a man and a woman uh, in a marriage have trouble, the way they solve their problems is to communicate. Well, what do you think is the difference with our Heavenly Father? You solve your problems with Him and you receive His help by communicating. That's prayer. So communicate with Him. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. He always does deliver. God is a provider. As it is written in the great book of Timothy, a man that will not provide for his family protection, food, lodging, and so forth is worse than an infidel. 
God was not in that class. When you obey and when you follow him, he will protect you. He will provide for you. Why? You're his child. He's the nearest relative that you have. And he paid this price for you. It's a numbling, a numbling thought when we realize that they delivered him up. They tried him. He who was perfect had never sinned. He opened not his mouth. He did not whimp up. And he stood there in your place, in your stead. They cried unto thee and, which, and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. You'll never be confused, basically, when you're familiar with our Father and his teachings. I am a worm, and no man approach a reproach of men and despised of the people. That's the way they treated him. They did David with Saul chasing him and Christ when he was on the cross. They deserted him. You're not going to do it in the end times. You're going to stand with the gospel armor on and in place. And you're going to be that witness. We shall not leave him. He has promised that he shall not leave us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, and this is prophetic, beloved, because these words were mentioned word for word at the cross. Hey, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Well, naturally, he was serving. He was serving the purpose of being our intercessor before Almighty God for being that perfect atonement, that perfect sacrifice for one and all times as it is written and brought forth so eloquently in Hebrews chapter 10. For one and all times, never to be again. Verse, and this word did not come from a Christian, a follower. It came from the high priest and others. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope. When I was up on my mother's breast, when I was a child, you led me. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. God, when people are destined, and naturally Christ was, and this is looking forward to him. His destiny was fulfilled from the beginning. We know his travels from a child on upward. And it all came to that day that the tree of life uh, that it was made available to you again when God took it from us. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. They were gone. They ran. Again, you're not. You're going to stand. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. They were noticed, noted for their huge animals that brought fear into the hearts of people. They gapped upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. Naturally, and they did. They said, what? Crucify him, crucify him. And the crowd was egged on. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of me. Why were his bones pulled out of joint? because he was hanging on the cross and his weight pulling the very arms from the socket as he did that for you. This being written a thousand years before the fact, can you better understand why he would say, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene that day. He's saying, go back and look. This is what I'm doing for you at this moment. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dusk of death. It's the sun's about to set, meaning of life. I thirst. 
16, for dogs, that's to say my enemies have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, They're pierced, they pierced my hands and my feet, they nailed me to this cross. Again, he did that for you, beloved. I don't know, sometimes if you ever ask, are we worth it? Have we disappointed him? Do we let him down? I'm going to give you the answer. We are not going to let him down. I, you know what? You start to turn away, and there's going to be a two before bigger than you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Facing you head on. Okay? We're going to charge. We have the victory. We have power over all of them. And we know how to use that power because we are equipped with the proper armor to take them on. They pierced him. Do you understand that this prophecy goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, when Almighty God said to the seed of the serpent, oh, he said that dreadful word. Well, that's what the Bible says, okay? I'm never ashamed of what the Bible says, what our Father said. To the serpent, the woman's seed, well, you will, you will uh, bruise his feet, meaning pierce them, but he's going to crush your head, and we're going to crush that snake's head. We're going to crush it big time with words brought forth by the Holy Spirit uh, when you are delivered. Yeah, you're going to stand because you're equipped and you have the right armor. 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and they stare upon me. And they did by that road. They mocked him. 18, they parted my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. 1,000 years before the fact, the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross. And here it was written a thousand years before. Does that not strengthen your faith in the word of God that it is true and only divine intervention could bring that to pass exactly as it was written? But be not far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. And I assure you he did. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling. The word darling should be translated soul. From the power of the dog, from the power of the enemy, and he shall. We don't have to worry about that enemy because Christ, who is always true to his word, has given us power over all our enemies. 21, save me from the lion's mouth for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Trans there's no such thing as a unicorn in the Hebrew manuscripts. This is wild ox. Okay, 22, you'll read this verse in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. I will declare thy name before my brethren in the midst of the congregation while I praise thee. Do you? We need to. You know why? Because he is worthy of praise. He did this for us. And none of us, in fact, are worthy. Else we repent and fall upon his mercy, unmerited favor. And then he uses you like a champion. Verse 23, ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, that's to love him, revere him, all ye the seed of Israel. And certainly we do. For, I, for he hath not dis, despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. You know, people will cry out and say, why does Lord let me suffer this way? Well, don't you think he suffered for you? You think he didn't feel pain on that cross? I've heard some would-be teachers say, I don't think he felt the thing. Well, let me nail you to a big old crossbar and see what you feel. He felt it. It was real. And he did it for us. That's a cop-out. But he did it gladly. 
he thinks we're worth it. So let's make sure that we don't disappoint him, especially in this generation. A lot hinges on those that have been sealed. He counts on them. It's important. We're not going to let him down. Period. Verse 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him, that revere him. With, what does he want as a vow? Love. He wants your love. And you know, he is so easy to love. He truly is. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. That's to say the humble. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Think about it. Never a curse. Never anything evil again. And it's forever. Forever and ever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. Oh, they'll try. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. Every knee will bow at that second advent because there won't be any confusion. Do I think every knee will be saved? No, I know people. I know what a thousand years can do to them with uh, wickedness working on them even though they're hearing truth and I'm speaking of the millennium. 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he is governor among the nations. Do you want to be in a winning party, a winning system? That system belongs to our Heavenly Father. It belongs to the Lord. Do you want to be in a party that always wins? It doesn't, you know what? It doesn't matter who votes for what in the kingdom. Well, well why, why doesn't it matter who we vote for in the kingdom? Because there's only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's it. You've got him, all right? I would advise you be pleasing to him, okay? Very much so. Why? And you are. Rest not assured. He's not that. As long as you love him, he is pleased, all right? 29, all they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. You know, this is one of the things that brings God down is when man tries to provide eternal life for his own soul. Do you understand that? There are two things that will bring him down. The, the first lecture we covered is one of them. Sodom and Gomorrah brought him down. But also he was brought down in Genesis chapter 11, 10 and 11 when the Tower of Babel was built. Why did they build that thing? They, were, they didn't want to be a flood to drown them. They were building them a way to heaven. They were creating their own salvation. You can't do it. This is why these people that are hankying around with cloning, I would have cloned myself where I live forever. Well, why don't you just love the Lord and live forever? Okay, you know. Why would the world want to see another one like you? <laughs> Whoa. Mercy, mercy. Lord does have mercy on us, okay? But these things bring God down, and people better, hey, they better wake up to it. God is, vengeance belongeth to him, and he knows when and how to take it. And he's going to take care of his own. He truly is. But nobody, they're going to find out that nobody can work out their own salvation, buy it, sell it, plan it. Well, you don't understand, brother. I am very deep into science. <laughs> You're very deep into a six-foot hole, buddy. <laughs> I mean, that's nothing against science. Science is beautiful. But it can't give you eternal life. That's what I'm saying. Uh, okay, uh, verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among all nations. He's it. All right? And um, I guess 27. All the, no, we got that. Okay, 29, 30, okay. Do you know what? He was thinking of you right here. Do you understand that? Even a thousand years before the cross, and then he was thinking of you during the cross again, and I'll explain in a moment. 
A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to him, to the Lord for a generation. You know what generation that is? It's the generation of the fig tree. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. He hath done this. Do you know what this word is the equivalent of to John chapter 19 verse 30? It is finished. And he gave up the ghost, the Holy Spirit. And he, his flesh passed on that cross. But to be resurrected again in that three-day period into the night after the third day. And he brought eternal life. He made that tree available not only, not only to the children of Israel, but to all who would believe upon him. When he thought of you on that day of the crucifixion when he was carrying that cross up that path and the daughters of Jerusalem were standing by that path weeping. And he said, daughters of Jerusalem, I'm quoting from Luke 23, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. For the, if they will, uh, for the day shall come when they will say, blessed are the barren. Barren in what way? Barren from not having hopped in the sack with the Antichrist, the false Christ, taking part in a fake wedding, but waiting for him. And then he said, if they will do this in a green tree, you see, he is that tree, you understand. If they, that means while the blood is running in these veins, what do you think they're going to do to the spirit, the spiritual tree? They're going to abuse it also. He knew they would. So he was saying, weep for yourself, else you be in this house or under the shame and the fruit of that tree that grants us eternal life. Have you ever wondered about the burning bush? God is a consuming fire. He did not harm the tree. And as it is written, do you know what he considers you spiritually? Spiritually, even he considers you. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, he said, You're my planting. You are my trees of righteousness. Why? Because you partake of that tree of life freely, because you partake of Christ. That's what this, this communion service is about, this Passover service, is that we partake of Him. This is the time, excuse me. This is the time that if you have a need, if you have an illness, ask for a healing. He's with us. He hears you. He loves you. He does, and he has proved it. He has proved it the hard way by dying for you on the cross opening up, and as we partake of this bread, it's his body. His body took the stripes, but your body gets the healing. It's real, my friend. Ask for it. Ask and receive. Ask him and receive that healing and his blood. His blood washes white as snow, sin, from every individual when you request. So be cleansed in this holy communion. Be cleansed with his blood. And as I stated in yesterday, a little bit yesterday, if you've got somebody you've been praying for, then take this for them as well as yourself, this communion. You think that doesn't, you think that doesn't touch our Father? As I stated to you yesterday, when you ask for a help for someone else, that's important to him. It proves to him that you have compassion, that you care about others other than just yourself, me, 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 but that you want to help those that are around you, that you love. So take this for and with them in their stead and ask for that help. Don't be, don't be shy. Ask for 
all of it, what they need. Because he can touch them. He can make them whole. He can, he can beautify their spirit. He can change minds where we can't. He can cause people to do a total turnaround. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I know what I'm talking about. You do as well. So this is a wonderful time, this Passover. The original Passover was so the death angel would pass over your family. When you partake of this tree of life, it causes those evil, that evil angel to pass over your family, to pass over your household when you certify it in the blood of Christ. They will not come near you. They will be afraid to bother your family. So remember those things. And don't be shy because he did this for you. And I asked you earlier, do you think we're worth it? The answer is no. But do you know something? That's why he paid the price for us so that when we ask for forgiveness, he stamps us perfect, paid for, paid in full. So accept it and partake with joy his body and his blood and know that he brings us that freedom. All right. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne, Father, we ask a blessing. We know your presence, Father. We feel it. Uh, be with us in this again. In Jesus' precious name, Yeshua. Amen, amen. I'm Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered and the mark of the beast tape. What is this mark of the beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. The book of Deuteronomy. The law was given as our schoolmaster. Have you been to school on God's Word? Certainly one way to go there is to study the book of Deuteronomy. Probably the most, the most exciting thing that Deuteronomy has to offer for you is that great song of Moses that those that overcome the false Messiah in the end generation will be singing. The law itself being the schoolmaster that keeps us out of trouble in these flesh bodies. Again, an education in taming that part of you that oftentimes needs taming through the old schoolmaster, that great book, Deuteronomy, the law, and its set ways of keeping you from harm's way even in this generation. You're going to enjoy it. The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad. Being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada, Newfoundland, the spirit moves. You got a question? Share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular entity, reverend, 
religion, denomination, or organization. God is judge. We don't judge churches or people. Everyone is, uh, a mature person has the right to make their own mind up. That's one of the great beauties of this great nation of freedoms. And uh, what you do with it is your business. And uh, it is, I would only say, it's so wonderful to have God's blessings. Let's let Him be judge, though. Let's don't judge people. Let God be the judge, for He knows even what people are thinking. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. You just need to talk to him, communicate. Let him know you love him. And then if you have needs, let him know, tell him. He knows how to help the righteous. I said he knows how to help the righteous. I did not say he knows how to help the wicked. He's got a little other thing other than help for the wicked. Think about it. Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Okay, question time. John from Minnesota. And we got, to, the Bible says not to eat the blood of animals. How do you know the reason for this? Well, it, I'm a farm boy, okay? We, we, you didn't, when I was a child, we didn't have a butcher shop on the corner. We had to butcher our own animals, okay? And if you do not bleed an animal when you butcher it, the flesh will putrefy. It's not fit to eat. You have to know how to bleed an animal. And um, uh, I, I don't want to go into details on it. I've done it myself, okay? It bled animals. I'm, I'm good at it, all right? I'm, that's, that used to be one of my jobs. And, and I could hit the heart every time, you know? Just give me a knife long enough, and that does a good job of bleeding. Okay? It, it preserves the meat, and it's not a good subject, but... That, that, that was life. That's the way we had to live, all right? You just didn't go down. There. We didn't have these markets on every corner where you went down and bought some lamb chops or something else. Uh, you, you, even sausage, you, sometimes you had to can when you butchered because they wouldn't keep, all right? So anyway, that's, that's the reason. It wouldn't keep. It has nothing to do with human blood or blood transfusions or anything else. It doesn't, it, what it means is, is don't eat a choked chicken, all right? Uh, I'll let that suffice. Cheryl from Arkansas, what generation are we in now? I know it is the generation of the fig tree, but is it the 14th generation? It's the last generation, okay? Wayne from New York, what you'll find in the last verse of Psalms uh, 22 that God says it is the generation. Wayne from New York, where did the word Yahweh come from and how come it's not in the Bible anymore? Well, it's, it's still very much in the Bible. It's in the manuscripts. It is Hebrew, and you have to have a Hebrew Bible before you're going to read it. I can, I can, hey, I can give you a pretty good clue. Anytime, example, in the Old Testament where you see L-O-R-D all in uppercase, you got it? Every letter is capitalized. Then usually if you will go with your Strong's Concordance, you will find that that is the sacred name Yahweh. Um, there could be other uh, times that uh, God's name would be El Shaddai. And El Shaddai is, when, is a name for our father. Um, Jerish, uh, Yahweh Shari is the God that provides um, he has a lot of names, but usually there are sometimes some of them have a title uh, affixed to it as to what he does. But um, it's, it is mentioned many times in the word. El Shaddai is a name of protection because it has to do with the female breast and womb, which means to nourish, and the womb is supposed to be the safest place in the world. I guess it's not that way anymore, but... Anyway, that's, it's, it's there, but it's, it's 
it's a language thing, okay? It's his name in, in the Hebrew tongue. I'm writing about your explanation of the Kenites. My strong says they are of the Canaanite tribe or taken to Midianite, son of Abram. I don't find where Cain comes into it. Please explain further. I think that some, bi some strongs uh, that you get in some places, the computer jumped or something on some people. Uh, I want you to make a note in the Hebrew dictionary in your Strong's Concordance, I want you to make a note of 7014. 7014 is Cain's name. 7017 is Cain's offspring, Kenites. I'm going to say it one more time for you. 7014 Cain, 7017 Cain's children. And it will explain in the Hebrew. Um, by the Hebrew name that there has nothing to do with Canaanites, but Kenites. Stephen from Minnesota, would you, would you explain the Millennium Temple? Do you know when it will be built? It's being built right now. It's made up of the many-membered many body of Christ. And when you bring a solid citizen in as one of God's elect, they make up that temple. Christ is that temple, all right? And, um, and he's going to reign for a thousand years and some of us are going to reign with him. All right? That means teach. Because we don't want to lose one soul if we can help it, but we're going to lose lots of them. Because some people would rather go with Satan into a lake of fire and destruction rather than to discipline themselves in wisdom. Strange. Zacchaeus from New Mexico, three years old. How about that? Where is heaven? Heaven is wherever God is, okay? And that's just the way it is. Someday, son, he's going to be right here on earth. And that's where heaven's going to be, is right here on earth. Uh, documentation is um, Revelation chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. Your mama can help you. Jackie from Nevada, do you have a book to start children on, I have a crisis where I need to direct these kids in a religious place to go, and I don't know enough to guide them. Well, you are in luck. We have, we have a children's book, and it's uh, it is uh, discovery of, of God's uh, natural uh, being. Okay, it's in. You'll find it in the children's book list. All right. It'll help you out a lot. I thought it was just two words. No? Say it again. Discovering God's natural truth. Discovering God's natural truth. And it is a, it's a great help. You know, a lot of adults uh, admire it because it goes even, it's sim simple, but it goes deep enough that it helps a lot of people. Susan from Louisiana. Would you please explain the unpardonable sin? I'm in fear of committing that sin and have thought that I had committed that sin. No, you haven't. It's impossible. Nobody could have committed it yet. Okay? It can only be committed as it is written in Luke chapter 12, verse 10. After the elect, God's elect, are delivered up before the false Messiah and they refuse to the synagogue of Satan, they refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. God says that's unpardonable. I don't care if you are one of God's elect. If you refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you against Satan, you're lo you lost it all. Do I think that is possible? No, I do not think that is possible. I know a lot of God's elect, and they, if there is any one thing they do that is the opposite of that, they already have in their mind, some of them, what they want to say. And that they're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to allow the Holy Spirit to do it. So I, I do not think one person, one of God's elect, will commit the unpardonable sin. They're, they're, they're waiting for him. They want him. Uh, Kenny from California, thank you for your Bible studies. You're welcome. Where and how can I study the sixth and eighth day creation more in depth? I've asked people around here if they have heard of the eighth day creation and no one seems to have heard of it, where can I find it in the Bible? Well, Kenny, you probably need some help, okay? And we have a 
tape uh, number 146. It's three tapes. And if you call, they will help you. It will take you through the first six chapters, basically, of Genesis. And if you can't read the Hebrew manuscripts, you need help, all right? And, um, and it, it will help you out. It's, it's about six hours of teaching, so I, I can't do it in one question. It is, there is a difference in the Hebrew manuscripts between Adam and Ha-Adam, F Ha-Adam, all right? And uh, that's the eighth day man is Eth Ha Adam, not just Adam, okay? So, Sadie from South Carolina. In Deuteronomy, it says it's unlawful or sinful for a woman to wear anything pertaining to a man. And a lot of people say it's a sin for a woman to wear pants. I wanted to get your answer on this. I, I get this question quite a bit. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. I'm going to tell you something. Men wore skirts then. They did. So you don't, don't let them pull that old pants thing on you. It says in the same verse, men should not put on women's clothing. You got a lot of these dudes anymore that like to dress up. Ugh, sickening. Yuck. But uh, they do, okay? Um, and, but what it means is this. I want you to make a note of Romans chapter 1. And there you will learn what it's talking about concerning how they leave the natural use of their women and as uh, men do and, and lust after each other. Romans chapter 1. It means a woman should not take the place of a man in a sexual act or a man should not take a woman's place in the act of a sexual act. Okay, Christy from Illinois. Was Judas born destined to betray Jesus and go to hell? No. Why, Christy, why are you judging Judas to hell anyway? I mean, that's kind of God's business. You know, uh, Christy, he repented. And when it came to his time of hanging, as it's written in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, he had a lot of help because somebody hung him and then cut him open from his... Uh, Juggler all the way down to his navel and his insides poured out on the ground. Uh, that's quite a way to commit suicide. He didn't commit suicide, but he did repent. And um, uh, Judas wasn't as bad as some people make him to be. He betrayed Christ, yes, and that's bad. But um, uh, he wanted to bring in the kingdom, basically, so he could carry the money bag for the whole world. He kind of liked that money bag. Paul from South Carolina. Should preachers or pastors get into politics and run for office, such as county offices or senators? Should they do both, preach and hold an office? Does the Bible say anything about this? Well, the Bible says something about it. The priests were the government in the Old Testament, okay? That was the storehouse. It's where the taxes, tithes went in took care of people and so forth, Social Security, everything went through the church. God is the same yesterday, He is today, and He is forever. I don't know, I cannot imagine why a preacher would want to be a politician. I really can't. But if one did, uh, that's fine, all right? Um, we, uh, we've got a lot of openings that should be filled by good people people that know how to appoint judges, because we have an enemy in this nation that blocks the appointment of good judges. And, uh, and uh, we, we sure need some good people running for it. But I, I, I'm not about to, okay? I, I, my my uh, profession is too important to waste time on politics. So, but, but I thank God for those men and women that do and do it right. They're a special people. Kimberly from Tennessee. I heard you say that angels don't have wings. Would you please explain what Isaiah 6-2 means if angels don't have wings? Thank you. I love your teaching. Well, I'm glad you do. We're talking here about seraphims in Isaiah chapter 6, and they're in vehicles. They were in these vehicles as they were in Ezekiel chapter 1, and they're flying. So what are we going to say? How do they get up there without wings when somebody describes it from Isaiah's time? And because they were flying and they were flat, 
Ezekiel describes them as highly polished bronze. And when they let some of their wings down, that was their landing gear. And they touched down. And people can't, were on those, and, and God's altar was on one of them. Had to have it to haul his altar around. There's some people will say, well, why did he have to have a vehicle? Well, I, he wants to go in style. It's all right. And, and he was de facto de jure there. Jim from Nevada. What happens to the soul as soon as the body dies? My wife of 36 years died last August, and I have had her cremated, and when I die, I also will be cremated. Well, that, that, that's fine. Ezekiel chapter uh, 12, verses 6 and 7. To be absent, I mean, you're instantly, when this flesh body dies, the spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your soul, instantly returns to the Father. And you've got a, a new spiritual body. Um, your soul may still be mortal, but you will have a spiritual body that will at least last throughout the uh, millennium to the great white throne judgment. Uh, but uh, I think that's, I, I, I know what it's like to lose a wife and, um, and just know that we know where she is and that uh, we're all going to be back together again. No, no, no problem. God's in control. Brad from California, I know we need to repent for our sins. What about the sins we commit that we don't know about and don't remember? Now, you're a worry wart, okay? How, how could you find when you repent, it's real easy. Just say, I repent for all the sins I've ever committed. God is very intelligent. He, he doesn't, he doesn't, you don't need to draw everything out in detail. Just say all inclusive. If it's something you think you might have forgotten, repent of it. And it's cleansed. It's gone. And then he says, don't bring it up anymore, okay? Susan from North Carolina. If the preacher is not teaching the Bible but centers on himself, what should we do? Should we talk to him? Well, I, I never tell anybody what to say to preachers, okay? Uh, nine times out of 10, he would be offended highly probably if you told him he was kind of self-centered. Uh, but a preacher should teach the Bible. That's what preachers are for because it is God's word and God's letter that helps people that makes people, gives people's life uh, meaning and blessings, happiness. Without him, there's not all that much happiness. Happiness of, in the flesh is short-lived. So um, I, I can't advise you on that because I never make comments about a church. But I, I do say one thing. If I were going to a church where all a preacher did was talk about himself and never taught God's Word, I wouldn't even call it a church and I wouldn't waste my time going back there. It wouldn't be a matter of talking to him. I'd, uh, anyway, I, I don't give any advice on that, so you're on your own, okay? Uh, Constance from Indiana, question. Is there anything in the Bible to indicate why Joseph didn't try to contact his father and ease his dad's mind that he wasn't dead. This confuses me as to why he didn't go back home once he gained his freedom. Didn't he care about his father? He, he lost his telephone number, okay? He, I think is what happened. The, the communication wasn't really all that much back then. And when he gained his freedom, he did go. Okay. He, he was even allowed to go back and bury his father. But uh, God was in control of this whole smash. And it had to go down as, as it did. And uh, Joseph being an able servant, and God, well, how do you know God spoke to Joseph? Well, that, that's what got Joseph in his trouble. God showed him this, um, this dream of his sheep standing upright and all the family bowing to him. And he was only 17, and he said, I, brothers, I got some good news. You all are going to be dogging it to me. I'm, you're all going to be right down on your faces, groveling and praying to me. Well, that did not make him popular, okay? So anyway, 
God arranged kind of the whole thing, and he, he was mature enough that he could understand that, okay? Ron from Minnesota. I was hoping you could explain John chapter 10 to me in verse 1. What does it mean, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door? Also, I have a friend who believes in reincarnation and believes climbs up means to heaven. Now, he's, he's ignorant, okay? Uh, it is given to everyone to die once, period, okay? And uh, anybody that wastes their time with reincarnation is dealing with evil spirits. Well, he can remember having been in Spain 400 years ago. Uh-uh, he can't. The demon that possesses him remembers 400 years ago in Spain, all right? Um, well, it's real simple. What does it mean? Uh, you know, uh, do you know anything about taking care of sheep? You ever been a shepherd? What do you do when you put them down in, in the sheep cot? That's a place where you can protect them and the wolves can't get to them. Usually it's a, it's a little round of uh, rock and it comes back around and you got a gate there. And the shepherd stands there with his staff. And as they go in, he counts each one of them. They pass under that rod and that shepherd counts those sheep. If something slips in over the side, they're a thief and a robber. So is that what your friend is? I, he's trying to rob something. If he thinks he's uh, reincarnated, you don't slip in. You got to do it under the staff of Jesus Christ. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all a lot. You know why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. Most important, God loves you for it. It makes His day. And when you make His day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, I want you to stay in His Word. You know something? Every day in His Word, even if it's a bad day, it's a good day because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.